Family Talk. Ron Hall, who is author of Everybody Can Help Somebody, a children's book that is really uh, quite extraordinary. Ron, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you, Ed and John. I've been watching you live this morning here uh, on my computer, which uh, is, is fascinating, the discussion. I appreciate you having me on your show this morning. Well, we, we've been we've been told that uh, we really do have faces for radio <laughs> and not really <laughs> for video. I so, think uh, that, that's, that, that's Ed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, I've got to tell you, I, I read this. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a children's book, so it doesn't take a long time. Uh, right. ev- everybody can help somebody. And you wrote this with Denver Moore, who has, uh, who's a once homeless man, uh, who's really, whose life was changed by one couple's efforts. And that's expressed in his book. And, uh, Denver passed away, I believe last, last year. Uh, but that's this correct. is, this is an extraordinary story. Um, why don't you tell us, uh, tell us, uh, about this uh, story that really is about Denver's life. Well, the story, this little book, what difference do it make? I mean, excuse me, this little book, say, uh, Everybody Can Help Somebody, is really inspired by our book, our first book, Same Kind of Different as Me, which was the New York Times bestseller for three and a half years, and then the follow-up book, What Difference Do It Make? Those two stories are based on um, a, a real real uh, God story about how my late wife, Deborah, had a dream about a homeless man who was poor but wise, and by his wisdom, our city would be changed. And she asked me to go into the inner city of Fort Worth, Texas, to find this man of her dreams. And we began looking for him, and after a couple of weeks, uh, he came through a homeless shelter, the Union Gospel Mission, where we were serving an evening meal. And he walked in and he threatened to kill everybody in the place, and he was screaming his head off, I'm going to kill whoever done it, I'm going to kill whoever stole my shoes. And Debbie said, that's the man I had to dream about. And she said, I believe I heard from God that you have to be his friend and find out what the dream is about. And I said, but Debbie, I was not at that meeting you had with God, and if I want to be friends with someone who wants to kill everybody, then I think I should be talking to God myself. (laughs) And um, anyway, I asked uh, one of the homeless men that was serving on the line with us, and I said, who is that man? He said, I don't even know his name. But most people on the street call him suicide because messing with him is like committing suicides. But he's, he's been on the streets longer than anybody in town, maybe 25 years, and he rules the streets with fear and intimidation. He said, the man's crazy, and he'll hurt you. So I would stay as far away from him as you possibly can. And I said... Thank you. Thank you for that good advice, as opposed to what my wife is telling me, that he's the man of her dreams. Right. <laughs> but anyway, after uh, I pursued him at my wife's insistence for uh, over five months, so I finally got him in my car, and I found out that he had grown up on, the, you know, on a plantation in Louisiana and had a very tragic life. Uh, he had actually been roped and dragged by the Ku Klux Klan, Wow. when he was 14 years old for helping a white woman change a flat tire. Oh. And the Klan accused him of bothering a white woman. Oh and goodness. he made a promise that he would never again speak to a white woman or trust a white person. He ended up in prison in uh, Angola State Penitentiary in Louisiana in the 60s, which was the hellhole of America. And he came out with no purpose in life, no education, and really no desire to, to, to live. But but he lived on the streets by a dumpster and in the, in the um, what they call the hobo jungle of Fort Worth, Texas, uh, basically for the next 25 years. So from time to time when he would get in trouble with the law, he would hop a freight train and land somewhere else till things cooled down. But he always came back to Fort Worth. But anyway, this was the, the man of my wife's dreams. And, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and but this man was prophetic. He had lived all these years in silence, just... Uh, protecting himself like a wild animal on the streets and attacking anybody that came near him. But this man had prayed and listened to God for uh, all these years, and he was just waiting for someone, I guess, to show him some compassion and, and, and someone who would actually uh, not be afraid of him. So uh, my wife was the first one uh, by her dream that was obviously from God to sit down and, and see through all of his anger 
and uh, learn his name and and begin then to break through this shell that he had uh, you know put around himself in his heart and uh, she began to melt that and uh, they developed this very beautiful friendship and anyway that was our first story we tell about about that in the book, Same Kind of Different as Me, which I said was three and a half years of the New York Times bestseller, and now I've just finished the screenplay that we're making it into a film. And um, But one of the... Uh, Denver uh, was, was the man of her dreams, and he uh, told us right at the beginning, right after I became his friend, that something bad was getting ready to happen to Miss Debbie. He had a very prophetic vision about this. And just a few days later, she was diagnosed with cancer, and she lived for 19 months after that diagnosis. But for that 19 months, the man that I thought had nothing to offer me in a friendship that I was going to be his friend, he stayed up all night long praying and talking to God uh, for those entire 19 months and every morning he would knock on our door and bring us a, a message from that he had heard from God in the night and this man was never wrong and the man that was the most feared man on the streets of Fort Worth that's dangerous homeless man was the one that God chose to to uh, encourage mm. us the most during this time we were a very wealthy family living in a multi-million dollar home but this uh, poor, dangerous homeless man is the one who uh, encouraged us the most during that the darkest hours. And on the final day of her of her life, he's the one that came and told us that this would be the last day. And he kneeled beside her bed and told her he he didn't know why she'd been holding on so long, except that she was worried about who would take care of the homeless if if she passed. But he told her he'd heard from God in the night that. Uh, she could lay down her torch for the homeless, and God had told Denver to pick it up and carry it the rest of his life. And so anyway, the later that night, she went to be with the Lord, and um, he shared her vision two days later at her memorial service and uh, got a standing ovation uh, for uh, the story. Um, and she also had a dream that a new mission would be built. And just shortly after that, by, by noon the next day, more than $500,000 came in for the seed money for this mission. Uh, within one year, $5 million. Within five years, $12 million. And the finest homeless mission in America was built right there in Fort Worth um, to, to house God's people, as she called them. Yeah. But after she died, he moved in with me, and he and I began traveling the United States as advocates for the homeless. And we, uh, through our story and our book, Same Kind of Different as Me, helped raise more than $80 million for the homeless uh, wow. in those um, nine years he lived with me before he died last year. You know, I was, I was just, as I was hearing you share that, that touching story of what had happened, it just reminds me that everybody can touch one life, and you never know what happens. When you touch that one life, that person that you've touched can make a huge, huge difference like like uh, he made in your life. Exactly, and what he's made in everybody else's lives. I mean, we, you know, the, there's an old saying that I heard years ago that the, the ripple effect of a random act of kindness has no shoreline and will never cease mm -hmm. to ripple. And uh, anyway, but our book, this little children's book about Denver's life was really inspired by our very first speaking event in Richland, Washington. We were invited there to tell our story for the very first time, and and we were telling the story about how Denver had never had a, a toy growing up, and, and a mother had shared this with her son. So the um, next day, the, the mother brings the little boy to hear us speak, and the little boy brings a fire truck with him, who is, which is his favorite toy, because he said he had a lot of toys, and that since Denver had never had a toy in his life, he wanted to give him his favorite fire truck. Mm -hmm. And Denver kept that fire truck. He put it in a, in a, a glass case like a piece of, of sculpture, and it sat on our coffee table for the next nine years until Denver finally uh, passed away. But when we were sitting there talking to this little boy and she was presenting the fire truck, 
and the, the mom told him, she said, when he gets old enough, I want him to read your book so he could learn more about Denver. And Denver looked at me and he said, Mr. Ron, why don't we write him a book right now that he can read so he can know the story? And that's what inspired our first uh, attempt to write this book, same kind of different as me. And after Denver moved in with me, I taught him how to paint and be an artist. And so he painted the paintings in the book, and I wrote the story. So that's that's how we did that. And right before he died, the book was complete, but we didn't have a title for it. And so I asked Denver, I said, what is your kind of your final message? You know, he was very ill at the time. And I said, what is your final message that you want to leave these children and he said, Mr. Ron, I want to tell these kids that nobody can help everybody, but everybody can help somebody. So that's how we came up with the title, and that's the message. You know, we want we want this book to be able to plant, to use it as a teaching tool for parents and grandparents to plant a seed of compassion and volunteerism and philanthropy in the hearts of these young children to, uh, to want to do something and make a difference in their mm-hmm. own community. Oh, that's great. We're talking to Ron Hall, author of uh, Everybody Can Help Somebody, uh, along with uh, Denver Moore, who was a once homeless man whose uh, life was changed by one couple's efforts, really was changed by God through that one couple. I want to make make it clear to those who are listening that while Ron shared some of the very uh, grief, grievous uh, uh, details of Denver's life, um, the, the book is very well written, and and it's not going to be, it, it's not going to be horrifying for children to read this, it's Ron. I want to I want to make yeah. that uh, clear because you shared some very disturbing details, Ron. We're almost out of time. Where can people get a copy uh, of this book? Well, I hope in every uh, bookstore, I, I would hope they would have that. But I noticed on Amazon last week it was the number one best-selling uh, children's inspirational book. So. Hopefully it's still doing well, but uh, everybody can help somebody, and I hope the children read it, and uh, they will be like some of the kids that we write about and what difference do it make, that, uh, that Open Lemonade stands to help the homeless and, uh, mm-hmm. and took you know, chicken dinners to kids on the two people on the streets. But uh, you know, I, I just want our world and, and the children to see homelessness in a different light because it's a very sweet story about Denver. It's a very touching story. Nothing nothing violent, nothing. It's just the sweet story of, of a man whose life has changed. And uh, it's perfect for four to eight-year-olds to hear this story. All right, Ron, we're, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being our guest and continue the great work that God has given you. All right. Thanks, Ed, John. Y'all have a great day. All right, folks, we'll be back after the break. You're listening to Today's Issues.